uh, students. Uh, before we begin today, I would like to use this opportunity to thank uh, the BBS television that has continued to give us this uh, opportunity for us to uh, study from our sitting rooms. And then all our sponsors, uh, we give up loud to them because uh, they have really enabled this program to continuously go on. So thank you so much. And thank you so much all the students who are attending to these lessons. I believe that you're benefiting a lot. Please continue attending and ensure that you ask any question that you've always wanted to ask or you've not understood so that you can be helped. I know every week, every day, actually, I receive so many calls, so many <coughs> emails and so many WhatsApp messages. And I attend to those students and I give feedback. Please always make sure that if you're, there is anything you've not understood, you always ask. And then continue to make sure that you do the exercises that we live here, especially in English language. You remember, practice makes perfect. If you do not practice what you, 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 you want to really be successful in, there is no way you can achieve better results. So whether you have studied what we are teaching here, please continue to practice so that you can perfect in your work. So thank you so much. I welcome you to this lesson. Today we want to look at, uh, <coughs> at idioms. Uh, many of you have really been requesting me and asking me to, to help you go through the idioms and see how you, we can come up with various idioms and then how we can use idioms in our compositions. So today here we are. I would think that the longer waited. However, if you can remember or recall, for those of us who attended the first lesson, we had composition writing. And I remember that day we specifically looked at vocabulary. And vocabulary we... We had a subsection of it or, 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 or when we use synonyms. So synonyms helped us to come up with various vocabularies to use in our composition. So today we want to add on that. So if you have the vocabulary now, if you can use the various vocabulary in your, in your compositions, so can you also add some idioms so that you can make your composition a little richer, a, a little more captivating, eye-catching, and so interesting to the examiner who will look at it? I remember telling you that the examiner could be the person next to you who's reading what you have written. The examiner could be, I mean, any audience that will be attending to you and will be guiding you on what to do, your teachers and so on. So today we want to look at idioms and then idiomatic expressions. We want to see how can we make our compositions richer. You, I hope you do understand that for you to make sure that you get very good marks out of your composition, you must make it very interesting. I mean, Make it very interesting. Make it very interesting. But making it, how, because the question would be from students, how do I, do I make it very interesting? These are some of the small things that you have to put together to ensure that you do not write the composition of, in, uh, of the English of is and was, as I would quote from Chinuachi. But uh, we are using the composition of uh, an enriched language, rich vocabulary, and then rich vocabulary encompassed with idioms. So today we are going to look at idioms, idiomatic expressions, and then see how to go about or how to use them. To begin with, we are going to, I know many of us have heard the definitions of idioms, but basically we could go through it just briefly. So we are saying idioms, as you see on your screen, we are saying idioms are words or, exp uh, or expressions that are used figuratively. If you can have a dictionary and maybe look out for the word figuratively. Figuratively means just to use images. Hmm? To use images. Uh, now a student would be wondering, am I going to draw pictures in my composition to make it interesting? In English language, we believe that language can be imagery. We can use languages to create images in somebody's mind. When you read somebody's work, you know, it should draw images and then you should come up or realize or understand what this person is really trying to mean. And understanding now, it does not only stop at understanding, but also interesting. That besides only, I mean besides understanding, can you also make your work more interesting? Can you make your work better than any other person's work? Of course, this is originality and creativity that I've already talked about. But all of these items of merit, like vocabulary, idioms, are going to help us really make, create images in people's mind. Drawing pictures without physically going, be, being an artist and drawing a given picture of a, of a child or of a snake. Or a, but you're using the language. So basically, this is what we call figurative. So you're drawing images in somebody's mind. Yeah? As they read your work, they oh, this is what this person means. 
Ah, and you find some people smiling, others crying. If you've read novels, you've read articles, you find somebody's reading but crying, and you're like, why, then why don't you stop reading? But no, I can't stop, I have to continue, but I think this is really painful. But how did the writer create the pain? It was the way he or she has written. It could be the way he has played around with the words, the way he has used the vocabulary, the way he has used the idioms, and so many other items of merit as we shall continue. So today we are saying that idioms are words or expressions that are used figuratively, so to create images, in other words. It is a word or a group of words whose meaning is different from the meaning of the individual words. So basically here, when you look at idioms, many students will say these are words with a hidden meaning. I, 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 I would agree with you. I would agree with you because the hidden means that you have to dig deeper. You have to dig deeper. You do not just find the meaning on surface, but you have to dig deeper. You have to go deep. And so we have continued to say the meaning is got from a deeper interpretation, understanding, or sense implied, but not surface interpretation. So if you think you're going to meet idioms and then you interpret them from the words or from the way they have been written, then you are wrong. And you may not actually find the meanings of these words. So basically, you have to deep, deep, to deep I mean to go deeper, you have to dig deeper, you have to interpret logically, and then understand. And then, if they are used in a given sentence, find the implied meaning, but don't go for the surface meaning. Otherwise, you may be let down. So basically, that's what I can say about the meaning of idioms. But what you have to understand is that the actual words may not necessarily, or the meaning of the actual words may not necessarily be the meaning of the idioms. So which means, like, uh, like we have said, that you have to go deeper. So don't look at the individual words and then you say, ah, I think this is what it means. No, let's go. We have to dig deeper. Maybe to continue, let's look at some of the examples of some of the, of the idioms that we have. But we are saying that many idioms are derived from our general experiences. Basically, what we always have in our day-to-day -day activities or environment. So we have uh, these examples. We have one we are saying that uh, we have this idiom, hot under, hot under the collar. If you can look at that idiom. Now, if you look at it and you say hot under the collar, then you're like, ah, now if I am putting on a shirt, if I'm putting on a blouse that has a collar, I mean, how, how does it become hot? And then... That means that for you, you, you are looking at the physical, I mean the surface meaning of the words because you have a collar, then you, have, uh, you, have, you know what heat or hot means, and then you, you want to relate. It's, it's kind of different. It's kind of different. Let's look, another idiom, uh, look at another idiom and say, breathe fire. Um, I think it's only the dragons that I've seen in cartoons breathing fire. But I've not seen a human being breathing fire physically. However, when you look at this idiom and it says breathe fire, you're like, ah, where are those people found that breathe fire? But any of us can breathe fire at any one point. Of course, let us look at the third one, which is let off the steam. Now, I have come up with these three idioms here. Just to show you what happens in our day-to-day -day experiences or with our day-to-day. -day. If you look at these three, hot under the collar, breathe fire, and let off the steam, I know you've already realized that if you, know, you could be knowing any of the two or one, but they all come up to the same thing, being what? Being angry. Hmm? So if I say that hot under the collar does not necessarily mean that there is heat under somebody's collar. But you're trying to show or you're trying to give an expression of how angry this person is. We could have an example and say, um, you could say, the teacher the teacher felt hot and uh, And uh, the collar felt hot under the collar when James 
refused to admit that that he had been escaping So here we are, maybe I could underline this with a colored piece of chalk. Here we are with our idiom. Okay? So we are, we are using it in a sentence. The teacher felt hot under the collar when, he, when James refused to admit that he had been escaping after being caught red-handed, jumping over the school fence. So here you're going to realize that the teacher became furious. The teacher was so angry. The teacher was so pissed off, was so annoyed because James has refused to admit, even after being caught jumping over the what? The first red, I mean the fence, red-handed. So this means that he was boiling. The anger was too much. So basically, this is what hot under the collar means. When you use breathe, uh, breathe fire, you could say, maybe in a sentence, you could say, my mother breathed fire. After seeing me back home, having been suspended for maybe anything, maybe, maybe for, uh, having been suspended for uh, escapism, she breathed the fire. Does it mean that fire came out of her? No. She became angry. In other words, that's what you're trying to say. And many others here. So if you, you talk about letting off the steam, that means the person was basically very angry. So... All these three, they are, focus, they are focusing on uh, being angry or uh, having a lot of anger. So I say all these refer to being angry. Though the image of anger as something hot inside us, people may often sweat as a result of raising temperatures. You know, you've seen that person who is boiling and just out of anger. So maybe that's why we come up with hot under the collar. But not necessarily that this person, maybe we have put some heat and has become hot. So these are images. Now when you say the teacher felt hot under the collar, the person is like, eh, hot under the collar. This must have been really too much. Now you are creating an image in somebody's mind. So that's why we're saying when we're writing our compositions, can we employ some idioms so that we may create that image that we intentionally want in our pieces of writing, rather, rather in, in the people who are reading our information, reading our compositions. And that will make our compositions very interesting. Uh, we're also saying the teacher, okay, that is an example of uh, the teacher felt hot under the collar. So, so we have written it here. Now look, let us go to the second example. Here we have lent somebody hand, our example two. One, we have... Uh, Lend someone a hand. A hand. Then we have two. We have try. Try luck. Try your luck at something. Try your luck at something. And then we could have, have your hands tied. To have your hands tied. So here we have lent someone a hand. Then we have try your luck at something. And then have some, or rather have your hands tied. Now, basically if you look at the idiom three, have your hands tied. 
That's not necessarily, actually, if you're looking at the surface meaning, you would assume that somebody has, somebody's hands have been tied. But actually, that's not what we mean. Have your hands tied may necessarily mean you are left with no choice. Uh, your choices have been, I, I mean, you have less choices. So, which means that you, you cannot maybe give help, you cannot, uh, you, you, you cannot help in any situation. Your hands are tied, it means that you, you, you have no choice but only know to help, okay? Uh, if you look at, uh, try your luck at something, also going in to do something. Uh, if, and if you look at, lend someone a hand, so you're going to see that all these three at least have a hand in them, something to do with the hand. And basically I refer to the activities that we normally do every day. So we are saying all these images of hand refer to performing an action. Everyday experiences use our, uh, we have use of our hands. But not necessarily meaning the physical hands. If you say, lend someone a hand, it does not mean that put off your hand and give it to the person that you're lending it to or the person who is borrowing it. But this time, you're only saying, if you say, can I lend you a hand? You're necessarily meaning, can I give you help? Can I help you either in washing utensils? Can I help you in uh, cleaning your compound? Can I help you? in doing that, but not necessarily getting off my hand and then putting it there. So basically we have to look at how these idioms are and then learn how to use them in our sentences. So if I may continue, we shall also say that idioms can be derived from our day-to-day -day experiences. I think we have already said that. And these experiences could also vary. And some of the things that we normally have in our day-to-day, -day, even at home, in our houses, there could be food, Yes, yeah, some idioms are, can be derived from food. For example, when we say, there is that idiom that says, food for thought. Hmm? Having looked at the statement the minister made last night on TV, I think it was food for thought. Does it mean that the minister gave you food to think about? I mean, I mean to, 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 for your thoughts to eat? No. It basically means that it is, it, the, the message that was given, you, you, you thought about it. You, you had to think more about it. And then maybe uh, think more and then here and there. And, you know, you think more about something. That is what food for thought means. So we shall have so many idioms maybe to, that talk about food, but not necessarily looking at the physical food or the surface meaning of food or the other words that are in them. Then we shall also look at idioms with war. Yeah? I, was, um, I was listening, what was I listening to? And then somebody made a statement that had that idiom. Uh, all, all is fair in love and war. And then I realized this is uh, an idiom, you know. All is fair in love and war. So don't just say that, oh, so because we have war there, I think they're talking about fighting. I think they're talking about love. I, I mean, there is a deeper meaning. Why is this person using this idiom? Can you think more about it? And how are you going to use it in your sentence? So we have to think more on how to use these idioms so as to make our compositions very rich. So we are saying other things that other words that are around us or other things that are around us. We have love, we have sports, we have hatred, and so many others that idioms can be built on. So let us look at some of these idioms that we have here with us. Okay, so we are saying we are saying that we have idioms like get, like get into hot, hot soup or water. Um, some of these idioms, maybe what I didn't say at the beginning, some of them are found in the our dictionaries. And others, actually the common idioms are found in the student's companion. As a senior three or senior four student, I expect you at least to own a student's companion. It's some small bluish greenish book. 
Okay? It is very small. You can acquire yourself such a copy. It has been there since time memorial. So it has so many idioms in it. And so please, you open it. If you have it, then you can find so many of these. Some place, in some places, some dictionaries, they are using soup and other books, they are using water. So we are saying get into hot soup or hot water. Basically means trouble. Okay? Basically means trouble. Now, if you wanted to use this idiom, Okay, actually on the surface meaning somebody would think of doing what? Uh, as in, how do you get yourself into hot water? How do you get yourself into hot soup? But, but it, it, it does not, the words on the surface do not necessarily mean or have the same meaning with it, what is being implied. What is being implied is you getting yourself into trouble. So we are saying here, the example that we have used is uh, by, by, Escaping, sorry, by escaping from, from school, from school, the girls, the girls were getting, were getting into hot, hot water. So any, any that you would wish to use. So here we have our idiom. By escaping from school, the girls were getting into hot water. Simply meaning that by escaping from school, the girls were getting into trouble. But if you, you, you because the word trouble is just a simple word. Like we said initially, the English of is and was. Anybody can use it. Even a pure child can use it and can make that sentence with it. But what about if you went ahead and used that idiom? I mean, many, uh, 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 many um, people or other readers will really think you as a person who has really studied English language. So we are looking at wild, wild goods chase. What does this mean? Of course, this could be fruitless, uh, could be wasted effort. It could be unsuccessful. And how do you make your sentence with a wild goose, wild goose what? Wild goose chase. Okay? So you could basically just say, uh, Malcolm made several attempts. You could say, Malcolm made several attempts at sports betting at sports betting but all his efforts All his efforts were a wild goose, goose chase. Now, I want you to look at that. We have said that wild goose chase means fruitless, wasted, and successful. And here we are with our sentence. Malcolm made several attempts at sports betting. But all his efforts were a wild goose chase. And then for you, you come out and say, eh. So after sports betting, Malcolm went to chase the geese. I, I mean, are you sure they're talking about the, the geese or the goose? No. They're basically t telling you that even after making several attempts at sports betting, he has never gained anything. It has never been successful. He has never, it has always been fruitless. That is what this person is trying to show you or to mean. Um, then we can look at another, another idiom. Uh, we, ca we have um, keeping something for a rainy day. Keeping something for a rainy day, who could say? Free, that is our idiom three. Something for a rainy day. That is our idiom to mean saving. Hmm? 
Now, if you wanted to refer to saving in your sentence or in your composition, you could just basically say, for example, P Pamela here, we are using, uh, giving an example. Pamela's parents did not show up on visitation day. She was wise to have kept something for a rainy day. What does it mean? That after the parents failing to surface for the visitation, at least if Pamela had not eaten everything from her suitcase, and maybe she had kept even somewhat, some money. So that's why we are saying that Pamela's parents did not show up on the visitation day. She was wise to have kept some money for a rainy day. Having saved some money somewhere. So that even when parents did not turn up, she had something at least to, to take us through. Then we have the fourth, we, we, the fourth idiom we have here is uh, a snake. Now the person is going to say, but a snake, a snake is a, a noun. A snake is a noun that if you gave a description of a snake, maybe uh, that, that, that uh, how should I call it? Uh, maybe a mammal that, uh, sh should I call it a mammal or uh, a, it's not an animal. But that moves, you know, wiggling and on the floor, you know, it has no legs. Eh? So, but, but here, when we say a snake for the idiom, we have other traits that we are attaching to this snake or that a snake has. So when someone says that you were a snake, it does not refer you to that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, mom or whatever, uh, that being that moves. This person is trying to refer to you as a pretender. A pretender? A hypocrite? Maybe a traitor? Hmm? A traitor, a, a person who is untrustworthy. Hmm? Trustworthy, you are slippery, in other words. Hmm? So we have some qualities of a snake there, okay? So when, when we use an example like, Okello is not only a liar, but also a snake. <laughs> that means that, first of all, he is a liar. He lies about almost everything he says. Then, he's not only that, but also what? A snake means he's a pretender, he's a hypocrite, he's a traitor, he's untrustworthy, he's slippery. So may, you, you may not mention all those, but just the mere using the word snake or the idiom snake, I mean it gives all those descriptions that you may have wanted to refer to Okelo or any other person that you want to use. Okay? So anyway, basically what we want to say is that we have our NB and we are saying that the tense in the main verb of the idiom can always change depending on the situation. So we are saying here our NB is that the tense can always change. The tense in the idiom or idiomatic expression can always change can always change so can always change um if you if you look at the example uh, actually our example three uh keep something for a rainy day for sa which means saving here you're going to say that Pamela's parents did not show up on visitation day. Full stop. She was wise to have kept something. Now we're not using keep, keep something because in our sentence, the tense keep may not be uh, very applicable. So we are changing the tense into past tense. So we are saying have, I mean past participle. So we are saying having kept something. Okay? So the tense of the verb, I mean of the verb, uh, used in the idiom or the idiomatic expression or statement can always change depending on how you are using it. Mm, I want us to go to, 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 to look at various ways of using idioms and maybe what they mean. So we are saying here, choose the what? Choose the meaning of each idiom from the alternatives given. And we have alternative one on our screen, if it may be shown. We have alternative one, which says, he resigned from his office to save his face. Now we have the idiom in red. 
to save his face. What does this mean? We have A, avoided being disgraced. B, he feared his face would be hit. C, felt shy. D, he thought he would be fined. But now, if you look at, if you read that statement very well, and you make sense out of it, of course, spare some more minutes to read the sentence, okay? As you spare some minutes to read the sentence, you, sense will come to you, and you realize that this, I mean, you, you make sense out of what has been said. Now, what is to resign to save your face? That means something wrong must have happened that has pushed you to the resignation. Okay? Depending if you know the meaning of resigning anyway. Resigning is when you have been maybe doing work uh, in some office, you've been having a job, and then one day you wake up and say, I can no longer do this job. You, you write a resignation letter. Many of you have done the resignation letters. Uh, you write that letter and then you offer it to your boss. And then if you are allowed or permitted, you leave peacefully. But people resign for various reasons. So this person, uh, uh, this gentleman, is telling us that he resigned from his office to save his face. But if you look at the alternatives you have, you're going to realize that alternative A, which means avoided, avoided being disgraced would be our answer hmm? in other words to save his face did not mean he feared to be that he was going to be hit maybe he realized that somebody was coming with maybe a clamp to hit him no but he, he, he avoided to be disgraced maybe he had done so many wrong things and so the best option was to resign from that office so as to do what? To save his face, so as to avoid being disgraced, being embarrassed. Let us go to number two, number two, uh, sentence two. Sentence two says that the boy always, the boy always flies in the face of anyone in authority. This means we have A, respectful. We have B, defiant. We have C, full of aerobatic stunts. And then we have D, supportive. What do you think as a student? Flying in the face of anyone in authority. Why would you as a student fly in the face of everyone in authority? You're always in the books of the teacher on duty, the, the master or, or, or for preps, you're always there. The head teacher's office, you're always taken there. The DC, you are always there. In the staff room, teachers are always taking you there after classes. I mean, are you being respectful? Are you being defiant? Or are you being full of aerobatic stunts? Or you're being supportive? I think B would do well for us. That is being defiant, okay? Being defiant. You're that kind of person who is always in trouble. You're a criminal of a sort. You can, the, the, the person in authority can never let you, I mean, you always surface in their faces because you will always do something wrong. So instead of you talking about doing something wrong, so you will say, you're flying in the face of anyone in authority. Then it's three, we shall say three. Nile FC team dash in authority after suffering a series of defeats. Then we have A, threw in the towel. B, folded up their towel. C, tucked in their towel. D, hid their towel. What do you think? Is it throw, uh, they threw in the towel? I would think that is the right answer. That is the idiom we have. So it is A, they threw in a towel. Threw in a towel. Eh? It means they gave up. It was too much for them. So they thought they would um, they would not continue with the soccer anymore. Uh, four, the lion nearly ate him at Savo Game Park. It was such a dash. It was such a dash. So here we have A, near bomb. We have B, bad shave. We have C, close shave. And then we have D, slim shave. Actually, <laughs> when you look at the, at the board... I think the white students have already seen it because it seems like the exam was already cheated for them. So basically the answer is C, where we have close shave. We have close shave, okay? So close shave means 
narrowly escaped. So now, instead of you continuously using, actually many of you when we ask you to form titles of your composition, what you begin with is narrow escape. Now, instead of saying narrow escape as your title, why don't you come up with close shave? Because it means the same, but this is richer being an idiom. Now we have, we go to five, which says, by emphasizing the point on, of discipline, the master on duty was flogging a dead horse. This means that. Now what is flogging a dead horse? Are you trying to say that the teacher got a horse and started flogging it, and it was already dead? No. We have alternatives A, wasting time, B, being cruel, C, rough, and then D, crazy and ridiculous. But I think A would take for this. So we have A as wasting time. So I was wasting time as flogging a uh, dead horse. Let us go to five, I mean to six, very fast. Um, the fight couldn't last because one of the fighters showed the other a clean pair of heels. <laughs> this is very interesting. A clean pair of heels. Now all of us have heels on our shoes. Does it mean that when you put them up and you show them to the person you've been... So that is what this means? No. We have one, ascetic. We have B, broken heels. We have C, as a runaway. And then D, as clean pair of running boots. But is that what this means? No. I think the answer is C, which means run away. Hmm? So next time you want to, to talk about running away and you want to use an idiom, please use a clean pair of heels. When I saw the furious head teacher coming towards our classroom and having had history of being a criminal, I showed him a clean pair of heels. So it means you took off. You could not wait for him to come and maybe uh, recognize you having been involved in some uh, atrocities. Atrocity. So basically, that is it. Um, we have an, uh, other... Uh, we have the family living. Uh, the family is living from hand to mouth. This means A, we have destitute. B, we have uh, destitute. B, we have uh, <clears throat> spends earnings without saving. C, we have unemployed and spends little and D, greedy. I think living from hand to mouth basically means spending all your earnings without saving. You have very little. And this has been used every day, every, every day in the news, in the speeches that are being made in this scenario of coronavirus. They're talking about people who need help. Those people who have been earning, they have, uh, they have been living from hand to mouth. Whatever you work today, you, you go and share it at home. Whatever you work, you cannot spare any coin for saving or any money for saving. So basically when they use that idiom from hand to mouth, they do not mean that you get in the hand and you put in the mouth. Hand and, but they only say there is little money that you earn, so you can barely save. That is what it means. And maybe lastly I could say, when the new boy in our school reported the disappearance of his pair of shoes, he dug his own grave for the angry students did not spare him. And A, put himself in trouble. B, was loved by all students. C, was sent back home. And D, fell in, deep, in a deep hole. I think what that means is basically he put himself into, uh, rather, in trouble. Because they did not spare him, you know, which uh, you, you have reported us, so we have to do what we are supposed to do. So basically those are some of the idioms that uh, we could have come up with. Um, we, could have, we could look at the various examples of idioms that we have on our screen. Um, as we look at those idioms, I'm going to put here a question that I'm going to expect you write on using some of those idioms and more idioms that your teachers have given you and maybe you have also researched it about okay so as you look at those idioms on the school uh, on the screen this is our question today
So with those idioms on the screen, we have uh, our question today. Write a narrative composition beginning, if it had not been for my parents, then that means you'll have to continue. You see the three dots, we call it a, 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 a ellipsis, so which means that there are so many words missing, so you're going to continue your composition from there. Please write your composition and remember that our composition should be between 500 to 600 words. Okay? 600 words. You can post your compositions on my email. Dot com. M. Nanyonjo 1987 at gmail.com. So thank you so much for attending today's lesson. I hope you have benefited.